Now that exam three and assignment three are over with, we don't have very much more of the SQL language to learn. We mostly have to spend time writing a whole bunch of applied SQL, so we'll see uh, several uh, more lectures of that. And uh, a few short videos as well as type notes that I've already posted, including this one, um, about a couple of minor features that are better to introduce in their own setting. So what I've done here uh, is I want to talk about null values in SQL, which behave pretty naturally for the most part, because we're used to maybe the way that null behaves in a language like Java or Python or C or something. Um, and I, I just want to illustrate a few things about them just by themselves. And so this is a, a table that I'm just creating here. And a few things to note. One, if you want to play with databases, like adding, um, creating tables, adding values, and whatever, you can always in dBeaver pull up a connection to a local SQLite database, which is just a file. And then you can run whatever queries you want. Um, and we'll see in uh, the beginning of July, I'll post some information that gives you a, your own database to play with on the server. So you can add whatever data you want and play with it that way. And that'll, that'll factor into what eventually becomes assignment six. Um, in the meantime, I've posted some notes about this and you could run these, what I write here in SQLite. You can't run them on the server because you don't have permission to add data to it. So I've made a table. It has uh, two columns, a name and this column called favorite number. And it's going to store the favorite number of each of these people. And I've got a favorite number, and so do these other three people, but Ringo doesn't. And the issue here is that this, I think, is, good ev is evidence of why we need this value to exist. So I could say, hey, here's somebody that I want to put in my table, but doesn't have a, he doesn't currently have a favorite number. Currently, we don't know what his favorite number is. So what do I do? Do I write zero? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe that means that zero is his favorite number. Do, do I put something like negative? Well, okay, the problem there is that no matter what I choose, um, that could actually be the favorite number. I need a value that is guaranteed to never be equal to any valid entry of this column. And so SQL defines such a thing, and it is called null. And it's, it's a constant the same way null is a constant in Java or, or C++. Um, one key thing to observe is that null generally can be placed inside of uh, any value. However, um, there is a way in the create statement, a constraint you can add, that rejects any attempt to insert null into that comment. Um, and we'll, we'll get back to that in, um, in early July. So for now, let's assume that we're allowed to put null into this column, and we've done this. And so we've indicated that Ringo has no favorite number by putting null as the favorite number value. And we'll just see what happens if I select from that. I get this. Predictably, Postgres and dBeaver together will show that that value is null. OK. Um, I want to see what happens if we ask some questions involving null values. So the behavior of null, null is a value. It is a special value, not of the same type as everything else in the column. And because it's a value, I should assume that it behaves the way you'd expect it. It, it has some defined behavior with comparisons. Um, it doesn't behave the way you expect it to, I guess. Uh, so I could say stuff like, select all the people who's, or select every row where the favorite number attribute is less than 10. And we see 6, 9, and 8. We don't see that null row in there. And so I say, okay, fine. Select all the ones where the favorite number is greater than or equal to 10, which is the, which is the converse. We also don't see the null value. And just for added clarity, select everywhere where favorite number equals zero. And nobody's favorite number was zero. Select everywhere that favorite number is not equal to zero. And we don't see any of, of the null values in the result. And so the first rule about null values is that any comparison where one of the operands is null will never, under any circumstances, evaluate to true. It doesn't actually evaluate to false, but it will never evaluate to true. And just to, be, to drive that home, I can't even say where favorite number equals null. Even the expression null equals null does not evaluate to true in SQL. And interestingly, the expression null not equal to null also does not evaluate to true in SQL. So if null appears as one of the operands in an SQL Boolean expression, the result is never true. Even if we're asking something apparently obvious like is null equal to null? Or is the favorite number column which has a null value, is that equal to null? Um, so then the question becomes, wait a minute, what if I actually want to go find those rows that contain a null value? And the way you would do this is with a special operator like you might use in a language like Python called is. You can't equal null. Any comparison, the equality comparison always comes back with a non-true value when you compare something to null. So I want to ask, which values are null? Well, I use a special operator called is. 
And that evaluates to true if the value I'm looking at is a null value. And I can also use is not for the converse. So that's one thing we have to consider. Another thing we should consider is uh, maybe what happens if I try to perform arithmetic involving null. This isn't going to be too surprising. So I'm going to say select name, favorite number again. There I have it. And let's try favorite number plus 5. And we'll notice that null plus anything equals null. So if I perform arithmetic on a null value, I get back a null value. There's nothing you can do to a null value directly, no operation you can perform on it to make it non-null. Um, and it's also worth considering um, what happens if I do Boolean operations involving a null value. So not just comparisons, but what exactly happens if I, if I perform some comparison operation with null? It doesn't return true, apparently, but what does it return? So I'll say favorite number, uh, well, actually we'll select both so we can see both in the same place. I'm going to select the, the results of this Boolean expression favorite number is less than 10, as less than 10. Now Postgres, uh, sorry, Postgres and dBeaver together have a very odd way of rendering um, Boolean values. So a true value comes back as a, check bo a, che a box with a check mark in it. A false value, so 33 is not less than 10, comes back as a box with no check mark in it, strangely. But you might notice, when I did the comparison between null when the favorite number was equal to null, and or what was the value null, and 10, what came back wasn't true or false. It was this box with a question mark in it. So it turns out that in SQL, Boolean logic actually is three-valued logic. There is a value true, which means that the answer to the question was emphatically yes. There's a value false, which means the answer to the question was emphatically no. And there's a third value called unknown. And we should interpret this third value unknown similar to a value like undefined, which means not, not that this question has no true or false answer, but maybe we could also think about it like this question doesn't currently have a true or false answer. Maybe at some point in the future we'll know the answer, but we don't know it right now. And so the name of that value in SQL is unknown. Uh, and I want to just, I'm going to use this text editor as a substitute for a board here, but uh, this the, the unknown value can participate in um, arithmetic expressions or logical expressions, including logical and and logical or. So we know already that if I, if I take logical and of true and true, I get true. If I take logical and of true and false, then I get false, because for logical and to give me true, you have to have both operands be, be true. What about this? If I take the logical and of true and some unknown value, what's the result? Well, it's unknown as well. What about the logical and of true, of sorry, of false and unknown? Well, okay, so false and anything is false. It doesn't matter what this unknown value is eventually. We don't currently know its value, but, if, but we will eventually. And when we do, no matter what it could be, whether un, the unknown value is true or false, false and anything is false. So just because unknown shows up in an expression doesn't mean that the result is going to be unknown. It means that if the result depends on this value, the result is unknown. But here, it doesn't matter what I put here, true or false or whatever. If this is false, the result is going to be false. And the same is true with logical or. So logical or, true or true is true, OK? Uh, true or false is also true. True or unknown is true, because if one of the operands is true, the result is true. False or unknown in this case is unknown. I need one of my operands to be true for the logical or to come out as true, but um, I know this one isn't it, but this one could be. We don't know, and so the result is unknown. Um, now that's significant. The reason we care about this mostly, it's less of a big deal than you think. It'll show up on an exam, obviously, but uh, it's less of a big deal than we think. We mostly care first, is a value null or not? Now that's not a question of unknown, that's a question of um, whether we've used the right operator. So to be clear, if I repeat my query from earlier, now that we know about the unknown um, value, if I select everything from favorite numbers, uh, where um, the favorite number is less than 10, uh, the where clause, when you give a Boolean expression to the where clause, only filters out rows that evaluate where the clause evaluates to true. And favorite number less than 10 evaluates to false on the number 33.3 and unknown on this null value. So they don't, they don't come through. If I ask favorite number equals null, well, when you compare anything to null, you get back unknown. And therefore, 
nothing comes back from this. If I want to test if something is a null value, I have to use the is operator. And to be clear, that is significant on an exam. You will lose the mark unless you use the word is and not the equals sign. So we have that, and that allows us to uh, have a column lack data in certain entries by using the null value, but we do have to employ certain techniques to actually handle that effectively. I also want to talk about the behavior of null values in aggregation. Now it's hard to do aggregation on this table and have it mean very much because as you can see there's only one value per um, uh, name and we can't actually add a second. I, I couldn't have Bill have two favorite numbers because Bill's name is a primary key so only one row can have Bill as the name. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I, I can demonstrate the basic point though, which is, um, let's start by doing this. Select count star from favorite numbers. I'm not going to do any group by. And we know that if we don't do group by, then we get the group is defined to just be um, the in entire set of rows. So there are five rows. Count star tells me that it found five things. If I, if I do count star, which is count the value of every column, the entire row. If I do instead count, actually let's try count name. So if I put every row into one big bucket and then I count the number of name attributes I see in that bucket, then I will again see the number five. If I do count um, of favorite number, I see four. When aggregation is concerned, the aggregation functions do not see null values. When I said count star, I'm saying count the number of rows in the bucket and a row is a thing. If I say count favorite number, I'm saying, okay, count everything that appears in the favorite number column. There's a six, there's a nine, there's an eight. Even if there were duplicates, it would count them over and over if I don't do count distinct. But it doesn't see this at all. And so if I do, uh, if I have a null value that gets aggregated, it, gets ag it just gets ignored by the count aggregation function. And I can show this off in a second way, which is suppose I count the number of favorite numbers defined for each person. This is a bit of a weird way of doing it, but it's the, it's the data I have. Um, so I'm going to select name count favorite numbers from favorite numbers. I'm going to group by name. And here we can see that we make one bucket for each person's name and we throw into it the row that goes with them. So John gets the number 9, George gets 33.3. This row does get thrown into the bucket for Ringo, but if I go count the contents of that bucket, it doesn't even get seen as a favorite number. And just to compare, if I count star, which is count just the number of rows in the bucket, we do see that row in there. We just don't see it if we attempt to count the value because count uh, doesn't see null values at all. So uh, this is a good time to head over to the other short video, which is talking about um, the other flavors of join operation. Uh, and we needed to hear about null values before seeing those because one of the hallmarks of the outer join, which is the join we haven't yet seen, is that it generates rates null values in certain cases.